So uh, let me start by thanking all of you for joining. Uh, this is an incredibly important debate. Um, I don't want to spend too much time uh, because we have much better comments from uh, Representative Lofgren and uh, Congressman Goodlatte coming up. Um, but uh, to quickly uh, flag this at the beginning, please prepare questions. There'll be ample time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, and again, my name is Sean Vitka. Uh, I'm with Demand Progress. Uh, so let's get us started by hearing from Representative Lofgren. Now, first, I'd like to thank Demand Progress and the Wikimedia Foundation for holding this virtual briefing on Section 702 and the need for reform. Our digital data opens a window into the most sensitive areas of our private life. For nearly 20 years, I've been working to secure real reforms to protect Americans' right to privacy. This has included fighting for reforms to Section 702 and to FISA as a whole. Recent revelations have made it clear that the time for reform is now. Representative LaHood asserted that he was the subject of the recently unearthed backdoor search of Section 702 acquired information. The FBI performed up to 3.4 million backdoor searches in 2021. And in a Senate Intelligence uh, Committee hearing just last week, FBI Director Ray admitted that the FBI purchased Americans' location information without a court order. Our privacy is at risk as long as Section 702 continues in its current form, as demonstrated by the FBI's continued warrantless searches of Americans' phone calls, texts, and emails. Now, this year's reauthorization fight provides a critical opportunity for Congress to address this continued threat to Americans' privacy that's really been ignored for too long. Democrats and Republicans don't see eye to eye on too many issues. However, there is growing bipartisan consensus that we need to enact reforms to Section 702 and to FISA as a whole. As co-chair of the Fourth Amendment Caucus, I'm building a bipartisan coalition that will demand meaningful reforms. We aim to put an end to warrantless backdoor surveillance of Americans. We'll also seek to close the loophole, the legal loopholes, uh, that allows the government to purchase our sensitive personal information from data brokers without any court oversight. It's never acceptable for the government to bypass the Fourth Amendment simply by writing a check. The Constitution is explicit in its requirement that the government must obtain a warrant before conducting a search. The failure to do so goes against our Constitution, and it really jeopardizes the civil uh, liberties of Americans. Now, it's important to note that Congress can enact privacy protections for Americans without compromising national security, as it has done many times in the past. To protect the privacy of all Americans together, we must enact reforms to stop the government from circumventing the Constitution and statutory privacy protections. I look forward to working with you and a broad group of bipartisan members of the House and Senate to get these re reforms done uh, to preserve the privacy of Americans and to defend our Constitution. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, thank you very much to Representative Lofgren for sending us that introduction. Um, I wanted to pull out that uh, she identified bipartisanship as one of the things that brings this fight to its current state of play um, as a big priority for us. And obviously you're talking to a coalition here. Uh, we also work in a bipartisan format. Um, one of the materials that uh, all attendees would have gotten in the invite uh, and will get as part of the follow-up is a three-pager that the Brennan Center, uh, who is with us today, uh, put together, um, which includes signatures from uh, everyone from Demand Progress, of course, to FreedomWorks uh, on the other side, and of course, a dozen organizations in between. Um, before we continue to the rest of the panel, I wanted to invite uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte, who's also the former uh, Virginia representative and former chair of the House Judiciary Committee, as well as senior policy advisor for the project on privacy and surveillance accountability to give uh, additional opening remarks. Well, Sean, thank you very much. And uh, it's indeed an honor to be with all of you. So good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to be working with this 
uh, panel. I know all the panelists well because we work together on a weekly and sometimes daily basis uh, in promoting American civil liberties, including my organization, the Project for Privacy and Surveillance Accountability. And I very much appreciated uh, Congresswoman Lofgren's uh, comment, setting the tone for uh, what's going to happen this year, because this will be a very bipartisan effort uh, involving a whole host of outside organizations, but many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. Just this morning, uh, Congressman Warren Davidson, a Republican from Ohio, and Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, a Democrat from Washington State, uh, issued a joint statement. That's excellent. I commend that to your attention. Uh, we have both uh, Chairman Jim Jordan and former Chairman and now Ranking Member Jerry Nadler, very much committed uh, to uh, protecting civil liberties and to reforming uh, Section 702. Uh, and we know that in the Senate, there are many leaders over there as well, including uh, Senator Ron Wyden uh, and uh, Senator Mike Lee are working across the aisle. And we know also that Senator Durbin is working hard on this. Even the House Intelligence Committee has a bipartisan panel working on reforms, but we think the uh, Part of this uh, issue is going to go to the Judiciary Committee, which has primary jurisdiction over the underlying laws related to government surveillance. Uh, my organization, and uh, I think a number of organizations, including some on, on our panel, has put out uh, a, a one-page statement, uh, which we'll make sure that all of you get, that uh, reflects what we think are some core principles that all of you should look at as you take up this important uh, issue, the expiration of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act on December 31 of this year. Uh, and I'll just read those off quickly. One is any surveillance of Americans should be undertaken only pursuant to a statute duly enacted by the people's representatives in Congress. Any surveillance of Americans should be undertaken only pursuant to a probable cause judicial warrant any surveillance of Americans should be subject to adequate mechanisms in both Congress and the judiciary to ensure accountability for a compliance with governing law. This has been a serious problem in recent years. And finally, surveillance should be defined broadly to include among other things, data purchases, searches of databases comply, compiled by governments and searches of private records held by third parties. So this is an opportunity not only to reform Section 702, but to use the leverage that the Congress has been given in this unique circumstance to also address other concerns so that if 702 is reformed, we don't see uh, government agencies simply going in a different direction, whether it be an executive order or the purchase of data. More about all of that as we proceed, but thank you, Sean, for the opportunity to welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Congressman. Um, so uh, we're going to turn to the, the rest of the panel. Um, before doing that, uh, I'm going to invite Liza to comment more about Section 702. And before we even do that, I just want to flag once again, one, we're going to have ample time uh, for questions and answers. Please send them in to one of the questions we already got. We will be following up with um, a, a number of materials. Um, it is helpful to know which are most useful for you. Uh, they can inform both the materials that are forthcoming, but also future panels. And of course, we're always available to uh, talk with you more directly in a, a less of a briefing format. Um, with that said, uh, this is a panel designed to give you an overview of Section 702 and the broader context in which the fight ahead of all of us is going to take place. Um, to do that, of course, we need to start with an overview of Section 702. So Liza, would you please take it away? Thanks very much, Sean. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here. I'm Liza Goitin, and I'm Senior Director of the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Section 702 is a broad surveillance authority uh, that on paper is targeted only at foreigners abroad. But in practice, it's become a rich source of warrantless access to Americans' communications. Let me explain how that happened. Congress passed Section 702 in 2008 to make it easier to spy on suspected foreign terrorists. The law allows the government to target almost any foreigner overseas and to collect all of their communications without obtaining an individualized court order. In other words, the FISA court does not approve the targets of surveillance. Its role is limited to conducting general oversight, which mostly consists of reviewing and approving surveillance procedures once a year. 
What makes Section 702 controversial and problematic is that it invariably sweeps in enormous volumes of Americans' communications because Americans communicate with foreigners. If the government's purpose was to spy on those Americans, it would have to get either a warrant or a FISA Title I order, depending on the purpose of the investigation. A FISA Title I order is another type of probable cause order. Uh, so to make this surveillance constitutional, Congress did two things. It required the government to minimize the retention, sharing, and use of this incidentally acquired information, as the government refers to it. And it required the government to certify to the FISA court on an annual basis that it's not using Section 702 to spy on Americans. Uh, that's called reverse targeting, and it's expressly prohibited. Over the past 15 years, it's become abundantly clear that these protections have failed. Rather than minimize the sharing and retention of Americans' data, the NSA routinely shares raw Section 702 communications with the FBI, the CIA, and the National Counterterrorism Center. And all of these agencies retain the data for a functional minimum of five years. Worse, all of these agencies have adopted rules, which the FISA court has approved, allowing them to search through the data for Americans' communications. So having certified to the FISA court that they are targeting only foreigners overseas and therefore don't need to get a warrant, as soon as the data is actually in their hands, the agencies start rummaging through it, looking for Americans' phone calls, emails, and text messages. That is a bait and switch that drives a gaping hole through the protections of the Fourth Amendment. The FBI conducted around 200,000 of these backdoor searches in 2022 alone. That's roughly 560 warrantless searches for Americans' communications every day. The numbers are lower for the CIA and the NSA, but they're still in the thousands. These numbers erase any doubt that what was supposed to be a solely foreign-focused authority has become a domestic spying tool that undermines Congress's original intent in passing the law, and it undermines Americans' constitutional rights. Fortunately, we can protect ourselves against foreigners abroad who pose a threat to the United States without conducting warrantless surveillance of Americans. So this problem can be fixed without having to sacrifice either liberty or security. I'll leave it there for now and, and go back to Sean. Thank you so much, Liza. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, Section 702 can be a little hard to, to, to make compact, but Liza does an excellent job. Um, I wanna turn to our remaining two panelists. Uh, Jumana Musa, who's the director of the Fourth Amendment Center at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and Patrick Toomey, uh, deputy director of the National Security Project at the ACLU. Um, Jumana, why don't we start with uh, you? Um, tell us, tell us about NACDL's uh, concerns here. What stands out to you as uh, what members uh, members of the audience should take uh, should know going into this conversation? Sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, I think, you know, the first thing that I would want to say to everybody who is in a position to affect reform is that um, you cannot and should not rely on the court system as an appropriate check on this kind of intelligence collections and the rating of it for U.S. prosecutions. And the reason I say that is because there's a couple of factors. One is there is a provision that should allow for notice in a criminal case if the information was obtained from a 702 database. In reality, notice almost never comes. And the reason I say that is, um, you know, one of the cases that has moved up that did have notice of 702 information being used is the Hasbashrami case that's now been to the Second Circuit. Uh, initially, Hasbashrami pled guilty, not knowing that the information came from a 702 database. And it wasn't until Snowden disclosures that then they went back and noticed a number of cases. Um, it, you know, from our perspective, it is doubtful that the number of cases that use information based on 702 collection actually give notice. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is, like I said, it's very sparse. But the second reason is from our communications with the Intel community, their notion of what is derived from 702 evidence uh, differs greatly from what we would think. From our perspective, 
if you started an investigation based on 702 evidence, no matter where that investigation goes, but for cause that you're investigating anything is based in this warrantlessly collected database that you're now querying. Uh, from the intel community's perspective, there's enough, if there's enough steps, they can call it attenuated, and then they engage in what we call parallel construction, which is now that you know you're onto something, even if it started from a 702 database, you then go find a different route to that evidence. And that's the route that you present in court. So, so often defense lawyers will be in court not even knowing the source of that information, the true source of that information. And so therefore there's no check on the 702 collection because there's no inkling that it's been used. Um, so that is, that is, I guess, one piece that I would wanna say, but even, even in that context, the cases we've seen go forward, the Second Circuit has said that there is a privacy interest in this information. They didn't have enough information from their perspective in the case that they were considering to decide whether or not there was a constitutional violation, but they did have deep questions as to whether or not that analysis had been done and should be done. And so I think, you know, again, from our perspective, the question of notice looms large, especially when you're using warrantlessly collected information against people in criminal courts. Thank you very much, Jumana. Um, now, uh, Jumana just gave us a good overview of some of the challenges that criminal, uh, in the criminal context that we see relative to Section 702. And of course, Liza gave us some of the overview big numbers that uh, reflect overall impact of Section 702. Patrick, uh, obviously ACLU has been one of the leaders, um, and I should note is helping co-host this panel with Wikimedia Foundation. Um, but ACLU has been one of the leaders in challenging this in the courts. Can you tell us, uh, you know, both what's something people should know going into this conversation, but two, fill us in on the most recent news on that front. Sure, Sean, uh, thanks for having us today. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I wanna tie together a few, a couple threads that both Liza and Jumana uh, talked about. And to start, you know, with intelligence officials publicly calling for reauthorization, I think it's important to be really honest about what sits at the heart of the debate Around Section 702, US intelligence agencies have gotten access to a rich source of Americans' communications without having to comply with the age old requirement of getting a warrant. And they don't want to give that up. And a huge piece of that is uh, the backdoor searches that Liza mentioned, which are an immense unanswered problem under Section 702. Again, a backdoor search is when an agent or an intelligence analyst searches through the government's massive Section 702 databases looking for the private communications of specific Americans. Uh, here's the problem with that. These searches run directly counter to the government's justification for this warrantless mass surveillance program. The government says over and over that it's only targeting foreigners who have no Fourth Amendment rights, but after amassing billions of communications, its agents routinely turn around and go hunting through the digital haystack looking for the communications of individual Americans they want to investigate. The Fourth Amendment requires a warrant to access those communications, but the FBI, CIA, and others use these backdoor searches to get around these bedrock protections. And that's, uh, that's one of the key problems that Congress needs to address as part of this reform effort. Uh, as Liza mentioned, the problem is immense because the FBI, NSA, and CIA together conduct hundreds of thousands of these warrantless searches every year. Um, and we have a sense of how problematic these searches can be because compliance violations have come to light again and again. Um, most recently, we learned that at least one member of Congress had been subjected to a backdoor search, but other disclosures have revealed that FBI agents searched for the communications of people who came to the FBI to perform repairs, victims who approached the FBI to report crimes, business, religious, and community leaders who applied to participate in the FBI's own Citizens Academy. So that, that's just a few examples, and these are really the tip of the iceberg amidst hundreds of thousands of searches. And at the same time, uh, as Juma Jumana started to, to describe, uh, the courts really have not been able to get at this set of issues. Um, the government in its um, you know, public statements has, has emphasized or has said that Every court to address Section 702 has found it lawful, but that's that's wrong in two and at least two different ways. First of all, the FISA court itself has found Section 702 unlawful on at least two occasions in both instances because of how that surveillance was intruding on the privacy rights of Americans. And in the public courts, which we rely on to have fair, 
open and adversarial judicial review of, of surveillance programs. The government has stopped the courts from reaching the merits of some of the key issues related to these programs. Uh, in cases like the Wikimedia challenge that the ACLU litigated, uh, the government invoked the state secrets privilege to, to stop the court from reaching the merits of whether uh, this upstream surveillance, which is one of the kinds of surveillance under Section 702, violates the Fourth Amendment. And in the criminal context, as Jumana was saying, uh, the courts have not been able to reach this, this backdoor search issue because of the government's use of secrecy to prevent defendants from learning about uh, whether they were subject to backdoor searches and how those searches unfolded. So this is, uh, this is why it's vital for Congress to look at this issue and to provide protections that uh, will safeguard Americans' privacy interests in their communications. Thank you very much, Patrick. And did you touch on Wikimedia, um, the NSA there, or do you want to talk about that more? Um, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit more about it. That case was a challenge to upstream surveillance, which is the government's uh, scanning of communications entering and leaving the country, international communications, including web communications. Um, and as part of a long running challenge to upstream surveillance, uh, Wikimedia provided evidence that it was subject to, to this surveillance and uh, was entitled to challenge it. The government, however, invoked the state secrets privilege to prevent the courts from um, reaching the merits of that surveillance. And uh, Wikimedia recently filed a cert petition in the Supreme Court asking it to resolve that state secrets question. Uh, but the cert petition was denied in Febu February. So I think that goes to show why Congress is really um, one of the few remaining avenues to provide the fundamental reforms that we need to address the surveillance. Thank you. And, and for those of us who aren't uh, Supreme Court litigators, uh, just to be clear, this means that the Supreme Court didn't reach the merits of these these uh, policy questions, really. Is that accurate? Well, it didn't reach, reach the merits of these constitutional questions, but that's right. It, it declined thank to you. take up the case. Thank you very much. Um, we've had a few more people join. So just once again, thank you for joining and uh, to flag again, uh, question and answer. We already have a couple questions. Thank you very much for that. Please send them in. Um, we will get to them before the hour is up, but we've scheduled 90 minutes for this so that we have ample time for anything that comes up. Um, and then also, just uh, as I referenced before, uh, this is the beginning of a series of panels. And uh, one side is to give you an overview, one side is to dive into substance, and one side is to keep you apprised of the political lay of the land. Um, so again, your questions to help us and you know, create the most informative possible panels and discussions. Um, but uh, you know, please keep joining these because we will be covering this uh, in real time to the best of our ability throughout the year. Um, so keep an eye out for future panels as well. Um, I, some of you mentioned, uh, and, and actually Representative Loughran as well touched on the uh, concerns about surveillance that are beyond Section 702. Um, so I wanted to get a sense from all of you um, what are some of these practices that we're referencing there, right? Is, uh, is Section 702 um, occurring in a vacuum? Um, what are the things that are, are adjacent to? And um, Bob, why don't you kick us off, uh, Congressman Bob Goodland, um, and, uh, and then everybody else is welcome to jump in. Well, thanks, Sean. And I think all the panelists have done a great job pointing out the problems with Section 702 uh, it has caused some people to say, well, maybe we should just let 702 expire. The problem with that is it won't solve the problem. Uh, just three years ago today, as a matter of fact, Section 215 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, another provision dealing with uh, government uh, records held by third parties that government could get access to without uh, going through the full search warrant process, that expired. And many people thought, well, that would uh, definitely be helpful. But I don't notice the, the law enforcement agencies even hitting a speed bump uh, with regard to respecting American civil liberties uh, in that regard. Why? Uh, for one reason, some agencies are able to use a presidential executive order, 12333, and other authorities. But those are done in a more of a black box environment where it's really hard uh, to learn uh, what is going on. Very difficult for Congress to do surveillance on, uh, uh, oversight on. Uh, another thing uh, that uh, I want to mention today, uh, and I hope others will comment on this as well, is the fact that more and more government agencies at the federal, state, and local level are simply going around the Fourth Amendment, 
by buying data from data brokers. Today, there's so much of everyone's life that is available uh, on the internet because virtually everything we do, whether it's geolocation information that uh, uh, is uh, gathered every minute uh, uh, regarding where each of us goes when we carry our uh, mobile devices with us to uh, searches conducted on the internet, so much information that can be made available uh, to, to, through third parties that the government simply uh, doesn't need to even do some of these things anymore. They can simply buy it. That loophole has to be plugged. Courts have started in the direction of doing that, but it'll take them many years uh, through case law to get to the point where Congress has the opportunity this year with the leverage provided by the expiration of Section 702 to, to uh, take measures in these other areas as well. We shouldn't miss this opportunity. Thank you very much, Congressman. Um, Liza, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well. Um, and uh, Jumana, I saw you unmute. So let's go Liza, Jumana, and Patrick, if you'd like to join in as well. Yeah, I want to echo what uh, Congressman Goodlatt said, that Section 702 is part and parcel of the vast ecosystem of overlapping surveillance authorities. And so it's not enough to tackle any one of those because the government can turn and move to a different avenue. And we've seen that happen many times. So I'll mention just one of these sort of workarounds. Um, we've been talking about 702, which is, of course, part of FISA. Uh, FISA applies as a general matter, and I'm oversimplifying a bit here, uh, when the government collects information inside the United States or from U.S. companies. When the government operates overseas, it's often able to do so outside of any statutory framework and with no judicial oversight whatsoever. So the protections of Section 702, as inadequate as they are, don't even apply when the government engages in these exact same activities overseas. Now, a geographical limitation on FISA's reach might have made some sense in 1978, the year FISA was passed, when surveillance of Americans generally meant, uh, I'm sorry, domestic surveillance generally meant surveillance of Americans, and surveillance abroad generally meant surveillance of foreigners. But there has been, since then, an explosion in international communication and seismic changes in the way that data is generated and transmitted. So today, foreign communications uh, routinely are rooted through or stored in the United States in ways that bring them within FISA. And Americans' communications are routinely uh, rooted in and stored overseas in ways that can strip them of FISA's protections. In 2008, uh, with Section 702 and the FISA Amendments Act, Congress tackled the first half of this problem. It ensured that the government would be able to collect foreign communications inside the United States without having to get a FISA Title I order. Uh, Congress didn't do such a good job on the second part of the problem. It left Americans' communications overseas vulnerable. Uh, so to complete the modernization of FISA, Congress should ensure that there is a statutory framework in place uh, involving judicial oversight for any surveillance that results in the collection of Americans' communications and Fourth Amendment protected information, regardless of where that surveillance occurs. Thank you so much, Liza. I actually want to draw this out a little bit. So you talk about the um, Congress tackling the first half of, of let's say, some, some sense of gap of, in FISA. Um, you know, what does that reflect in terms of the last, you know, two decades, uh, I guess, 15 years since 702 passed, you know, does Congress regularly go through questions of uh, how this other surveillance should be occurring? Uh, has Congress uh, spent a lot of time focused on this other side of the equation that does seem to be equally important if we're going to protect, if we're going to provide a way to access warrantless, warrantlessly access communications domestically, what does that mean about Americans' communications overseas? Is that something that Congress has been debating? No, not at all. And you know, just as 
uh, this sort of extra statutory surveillance doesn't involve any judicial review, it generally doesn't involve much congressional oversight. There's certainly not any open congressional oversight. The intelligence committees uh, will say that they do some oversight, although um, at some point after the Snowden disclosures, uh, Senator Feinstein actually uh, said, you know, really, we don't have much uh, visibility on this kind of extra, uh, extra statutory surveillance uh, at all. So there's really uh, minimal congressional involvement in this extra statutory uh, surveillance. And because there is no statutory authority that governs it, and therefore there's no sunset, there's nothing to amend, uh, it simply doesn't come up. Uh, and that, it, it should, but it doesn't. And that is why I think Congressman Goodlatte uh, really hits the nail on the head when he says, we have to use the leverage of the expiration of Section 702 to address all these other uh, problematic and overlapping aspects of surveillance that otherwise would really escape uh, congressional action. Thank you. Um, Jumana and Patrick, and I don't want to be specific about which of you goes first, by the way. So uh, whoever whoever is more raring to go. I think I'm raring to go. Um, I want to pick up on a few things um, that both Liza and Congressman Goodlatte had to say. You know, I obviously come to this from the perspective of what happens in criminal proceedings, but I think the critical thing for people to understand is that that applies, that really impacts so much more than, you know, the accused in a criminal case. Because right now, sort of in this era of big data and easy access to digital communications that we are living through, we are watching that kind of access almost swallow the purpose of the Fourth Amendment, right, which is to protect everybody's privacy their personal papers affects their communications. And the reason I say that is this, because you know we're in this moment where yes, we're looking at the specific 702 uh, collection. Even in the context of the 702 collection, some of the types of uh, breaches of that information that we've seen that Patrick was referring to, right? Looking, uh, looking up the information of people who wanna to apply to a Citizens Academy or working at the FBI, things that are completely outside of the, anybody's imagined scope of the program would not have happened, but for the fact that you can just access that database, right? There's no warrant requirement. There's no need to stop or pause or do a check-in before that querying was happening. And I think the other piece of that that I would like to remind people is even of the kinds of breaches that we know have happened through this kind of transparency and reporting and data, that is from sort of some investigations where they just sort of pop into different offices to see what's happening here. That's not a comprehensive look. What that means is we may have learned about the, the investigation into a local political party or a member of Congress. What we don't know is how many times something like that has happened, because there is no way to sort of comprehensively look at, you know, everybody who's querying everywhere. I'm, I'm sounding like the Oscars, right? Um, I think the other piece, though, that I, I would like to bring up with this is the fact that even in the context of addressing 702, I think this is so important. It's been said in a couple of different ways, but where we find ourselves often as a place where it's almost like squeezing the balloon, where Congress says, okay, you can't do it in this place, but then all the air just goes over here and it gets absorbed by a different program. You say, you can't do it in this place. All the air goes over here, it gets absorbed by a different program. So whether it's another FISA program, whether it is uh, executive orders, whether it is the ability to just write a check and purchase data to get around any kind of warrant requirement in terms of accessing US person information, communications, data, all of that is of a piece. And so. We strongly encourage Congress to think about this, not just in terms of this particular program, which again, without Congress, congressional action, we're not going to get um, really answers from the court, but to really think about not just the programs, but the behaviors and to monitor and to, to modify and to actually put protections in on that behavior by the government to access people's digital communications, their data, uh, all their personal private, you know, personal information without any kinds of judicial process. Because again, if we think about it narrowly in terms of, oh, you need a warrant because this is you know, a criminal investigation, then people start to kick up things well because it's foreign intelligence, there may be you know, terrorism, there may be some kind of frightening crime at play. That's a way of getting people to look away from the, what is really the critical issue, which is that people's personal private communications, their digital data is all being collected in a way that the government has been able to access repeatedly through many different venues without a warrant. And so I think that's that's part of how I hope this gets approached, which is 
again, trying to modify and address the behavior and what the government can and cannot access in order to protect people's privacy versus just thinking about it in terms of this narrow lane of one program, um, which has shown repeatedly that it can't even comply with its own minimization and other types of restrictions. Thank you so much, Jumana. Um, Patrick, I want to invite you to get in here uh, if you'd like. I'll just say the takeaway is that there should be a comprehensive, consistent framework for protecting Americans' communications. And uh, there should not be these gaps that are growing in significance that leave Americans' communications vulnerable based on the happenstance of whether they're collected overseas or collected on US soil. Um, and um, an American has a privacy, protected privacy interest in their communication whether it's intercepted abroad or here on U.S. soil, and there should be a single standard that provides strong protection. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, that's most of the discussion that we're going to have. We have a lot more questions for the panelists, uh, some from you. I want to answer uh, one that came in already, which was uh, whether or not there's a written brief or summary of the Wikimedia v. NSA case um, that folks can uh, have access to. Uh, I'm more than happy to include that in the panel. I think Patrick may have written something in this territory, but um, uh, in any event, I'm confident that there is a, a write-up that we will circulate. So thank you for flagging that as helpful. Um, for now, uh, we're going to turn to Ali Marino from the Wikimedia Foundation to do a presentation on some of uh, so, some some important data points that I think are uh, critical to understanding where the American people are on these issues. Uh, Ali, can you hear us and can you take the screen over? Good morning, everyone. I can hear you and I am going to share the screen now. I think I'm having a permission issue. Sean, can you pull it up, please? Sure can. Just one second, everybody. All right. Uh, my apologies. Here we go. All right, Allie, we are ready for you. Well, so hi everyone, I'm Ali Marino. I'm with the Wikimedia Foundation. And for anyone who isn't familiar, we are the nonprofit foundation that hosts Wikipedia and other free knowledge projects. I'm going to walk you through the results of four studies that demonstrate the chilling effects of and the plummeting support for surveillance. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, I'm gonna go through four studies and these studies represent the views of thousands of Americans over a period of 10 years. The first of these is from way back in 2013, Pen America surveyed their members, namely journalists and other writers, um, and found that their membership was both overwhelmingly worried about government surveillance and that they also engaged in self-censorship as a result. Um, over 50% of their members reported engaging in self-censorship and 92% said that they believed that the personal data collected by the United States government will be vulnerable to abuse for many years because it might not be appropriately safeguarded or ultimately deleted. Next slide. The types of self, excuse me, the types of self-censorship that Penn America's membership reported engaging in, including included avoiding certain activities on social media, avoiding or being reluctant to communicate with friends, family, and particularly for journalists sources located abroad um, for fear of endangering those people. And they also avoided pursuing certain research topics and writing or speaking about certain subjects. Next. Um, the next two studies are going to talk about chilling effects. This slide is for anyone who is not familiar. This is the definition provided by the researchers of the next two studies. Um, the next two studies, they were concerned with the capacity of government surveillance to quote unquote chill or discourage people from speaking or acting freely out of fear of some kind of punishment. Next slide. So these studies were conducted by John Penny. The first of these came out in 2016, where Penny was looking at the chilling effects of government surveillance. Um, quickly, I just want to point out that the chilling effects of government surveillance are a big part about why we at the Wikimedia Foundation care about this issue. Wikipedia is 
one of the most widely visited websites in the world. It has been for over 20 years. We have volunteers, moderators, readers, and staff all over the world. And if people don't feel like they can access and share information and knowledge on Wikipedia because of fears of government surveillance and especially foreign government surveillance, that is a problem. It's a problem for us as an organization that seeks to embody free access to information. It's a problem for anyone who believes in free speech and the freedom to associate. And I hope that everyone watching this recognizes that they have personally benefited from these personal freedoms that we enjoy and that we as a foundation seek to protect and has benefited from the larger free knowledge movement. I know that I have. Back to the study, uh, Penny looked at tens of millions of Wikipedia page views between 2012 and 2014, specifically looking at pages that were related to terms that Homeland Security used for social media, media monitoring. Um, the articles included the Wikipedia page for attack, for nationalism, and for pirates. Um, Penny found that the traffic to these pages suddenly and dramatically dropped up to 25% in some cases, on average 19.5%, directly after the mass surveillance disclosures were reported on in the press in 2013. He also found that this drop in page traffic was not a temporary problem, but that it was long-term and ongoing in the months that followed. Next. The second of these came out in 2017. 78% um, of American internet users said that government surveillance chills their online speech. 78% is obviously a huge number and it's disturbing, but it's even more so when you look at the second finding that greater awareness of surveillance news and surveillance activity led to more chilled speech. And so just think about what that means for the debate that's ahead of us over the next nine months. What the study shows is that the more informed that people are, the more that they care about this stuff and the more that they know the bigger impact that it has on them. And this applies to your constituents as well. And to put the 78% number in perspective, if you look at the third bullet point, the only thing that had a greater chilling effect than government surveillance in this study were personal legal threats from a third party at 81%. Government surveillance was a close second at 78%. And it also beat out corporate surveillance at 71%, which is obviously a great concern to your constituents. But what these studies demonstrate is that the chilling effects that your constituents feel, the impact that this surveillance has on them is even greater when the government is the one doing the spying um, as opposed to a private corporation. Next slide, please. The final study that I'm going to talk about is this AP NORC poll. Um, the great thing about this is that they have results from 2011, 2013, and 2021, so we can track the results and the changes in public opinion over time. Um, as Sean said before, you're going to get this study. You're also going to get these slides. Um, but here's the important thing to take away from this study. American support for warrantless surveillance of communications just plummeted since 2011. Um, the version of the graph on the right does a lot to show us what we're looking at over time. And I wanna briefly highlight two of the items on here um, that are relevant to sec our section 702 discussion. So the prompt was, do you believe that the government should do X without a warrant? So the first one was monitor phone calls made outside of the US. In 2011, 36% of people opposed it, 49% supported it. 10 years later in 2021, those results essentially reversed. 44% opposed it and 28% supported it. Same thing with email sent between people outside of the United States. In 2011, 30% opposed, 47% supported. 10 years later in 2021, 46% opposed and 27% supported. So again, for these two items, the results effectively reversed over 10 years. And again, just to be clear, 46% of people oppose the warrantless surveillance of emails sent between people outside of the United States. And this is what Section 702 is for. And so even if there wasn't a single compliance issue, and we all know that 
there have been compliance issues, you would still have significantly more Americans opposing this type of surveillance than supporting it. Next slide, please. Um, so we've covered the chilling impact of warrantless surveillance from the perspective of Wikipedia. We've covered polling over a decade that depicts a clear trend in the changes in public opinion. This is the too long didn't read for the AP Newark studies, which we encourage you to look at in detail when you do get the materials after the briefing. Within a decade, support for this warrantless surveillance just has been cut in half across the board. And now Americans, most Americans oppose such surveillance, even if it's limited to foreigners' communications. Um, next slide. This wouldn't be a Wikimedia presentation without a source slide. Um, next slide, please. My email's at the bottom if you have any questions. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with you uh, on this this year. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, you know, these are pretty uh, impressive findings. The AP NORC poll, of course, that's Associated Press, um, came out two years ago. Uh, one may imagine uh, that there are more, more polling uh, will come out throughout this year. Um, but 2021 is not the end of when these civil liberties concerns stopped. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how much uh, these trends continue. Um, but that reversal uh, is, is stunning. I remember when I first saw that poll, um, I was surprised. Um, we're going to move to uh, questions and answers. Um, and I'm actually going to, I have a, a number of myself, but um, uh, I'm uh, so thankful that some have, of you have already sent in answers or questions rather. Um, so I'd like to kick this one uh, right to the panel. Um, Congressman, maybe we can start with you. Uh, somebody asked, what can our member of Congress best do to protect American privacy? Well, I think uh, one of the things they should do is to uh, call for hearings uh, in the House Judiciary Committee, so particularly if they're on the Judiciary Committee, that would be particularly important. Secondly, I would uh, recommend that they get very well informed on the issue. There are many, many uh, articles that are being generated in the media. There are uh, many, many uh, one, two, three pagers that various organizations, including our organizations, have put out. We, uh, certainly want to make those available to all of you and hope that you'll study those uh, carefully. Uh, another would be to uh, ask your constituents, uh, have the member of Congress, and they, they often do polls and they do uh, uh, telephone town halls. They can make this a poll question or a question, a subject of a telephone town hall. I think they will find there's a tremendous amount of concern out there, especially as they describe some of the abuses. And uh, one of the things that we have available is a very uh, significant uh, discussion of some of the more serious abuses that have occurred uh, uh, in uh, the use of 702 itself and then some of these other uh, related issues that we've been discussing here today. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Liza. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I agree with everything that Congressman Goodlatte said. I would also um, advise uh, your, your bosses uh, to be careful about um, some fairly misleading information and red herrings that I think the the administration unfortunately is putting out right now. So you know one of the one of the misleading uh, statements that you're going to hear over and over again is that Section 702 cannot be targeted against Americans. It can only be targeted against foreigners overseas. Targeting is being used in an extremely legalistic way. Um, very technical term. And uh, in practice, as we have explained, uh, untold volumes of Americans' communications. Really, it has to be enormous amounts. And the government doesn't deny that, although uh, they have steadfastly refused to provide even an estimate of how many uh, are collected under Section 702. And they are searched routinely up to 200,000 times a year by the FBI. So you just need to take this statement that Section 702 is targeted only at foreigners overseas with the enormous grain or, or sack of salt uh, that, that it deserves. Um, and then uh, similarly, you're going to hear uh, people trying to make distinctions between uh, Title I of FISA and Section 702. And they're gonna say all of the problems have been with Title I. Uh, that was the authority that was used to conduct surveillance of former Trump campaign aide Carter Page. 
um, and Section 702, uh, there really haven't been any major problems. And Section 702 uh, is, again, targeted only at foreigners overseas. Uh, bear in mind that Title I of FISA is the high watermark when it comes to protections for Americans. So if you're seeing these kind of errors and mistakes and really sort of bad behavior by the FBI in a Title I application, just imagine what's happening in Section 702 where there is no individualized review by the court. Uh, and you don't have to imagine because we've had multiple FISA court opinions stretching back 15 years that recount violation after violation, often systemic violations by all of the agencies that are involved in this program. So it's just going to be important. Oh, and just one more, and I'm sorry, I know I'm taking up a lot of time, but the government will, the administration will present all of the examples in which Section, Section 702 has been used uh, to help uh, address threats that are posed by bad foreign actors. Uh, that's not the point. Uh, there, there is the government can and should be able to conduct surveillance of foreigners overseas who pose a threat to United States interests. That's not the issue here. The issue is whether that program should be used, repurposed, to conduct warrantless surveillance of Americans. So I, I guess what I would say is the best thing that your bosses can do is to keep their eye on the ball and not to be distracted by some of these talking points. Thank you very much, Liza. Um, Patrick, I think this might be good for you. Oh, sorry, Jumana, do you want to jump in? All right, Patrick, I think this might be good for you. I, I'd like to, um, th this is, it can be easy to get lost in the weeds here, but I hope, uh, and I think the panel has done a good job presenting the overview and the general framework for this debate. I want to dive into something relatively specific, though, which are uh, two news items that came out of last week's hearings in front of the intelligence committees. Um, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to invite Patrick to answer this, but of course everybody's welcome to jump in. Dir FBI Director Ray, uh, during the Senate hearing, um, described uh, the FBI previously purchasing geolocation information uh, that had been uh, quote derived from internet advertising, and I think that's I think that's important to dissect. Um, Patrick, could you do that for us? Absolutely, Sean. Um, yeah, that's that's right. Director Ray uh, acknowledged for the first time publicly that the FBI had, in the course of a pilot program, purchased uh, American sensitive location information. Uh, he said that, as far as he was aware, it wasn't purchasing that specific type of information from internet advertisers. So it was a very narrow um, statement about what types of sensitive uh, location information the FBI is acquiring right now. But it reveals, and I think underscores, um, a practice that we have seen reported on more and more widely, which is intelligence agencies of various kinds um, purchasing data and buying their way around the Fourth Amendment by acquiring sensitive location information, not by compelling um, providers or data brokers to turn it over with a warrant, but use, you know, breaking out their checkbook and purchasing it from these, these data brokers on the commercial market. And that is, is just a complete end run around the Fourth Amendment. The Supreme Court has said that American sensitive location data um, is protected by the Fourth Amendment when the government demands it in, you know, at least seven days or more. Um, and the, the government is, is instead buying uh, this information, um, not just for one person at a time, but for thousands and thousands of people. And um, we certainly need to know more about how individual agencies, including the FBI, are acquiring sensitive location information. Um, but Congress needs to look hard at uh, these types of purchases too, as, as Congressman Goodlatte mentioned earlier, because it's one of the ways that um, agencies sidestep the protections that Congress and the courts have imposed around our sensitive data. And so addressing that and ensuring that there is comprehensive protection is, is one of the things Congress should be looking at this year. Thank you. And uh, I see Jaman is unmuted. I just want to quickly remind everybody, please send your questions into the Q&A. Um, we are getting through them now. Uh, Jumana, uh, did you want to jump in here? I did, because I think it's important to distinguish sort of why information was collected versus what the government is doing with it. 
And so when we talk about whether data is being purchased or requisitioned writ large from tech companies, you know, information, location information that is gathered for advertising purposes is gathered to say, you know, you're somewhere in this region of town is Taco Tuesday, and this is where you can find great tacos, right? Or you've been shopping for shoes online. We know you're located next to these five shoe stores they want to advertise to you. Um, however someone feels about that, the sort of the follow-on impacts of that are not great in the sense that like, maybe you don't want tacos, you're not actually going to buy a pair of shoes, you know, you move on. But when we talk about taking that information to track where people are, it can track people in really sensitive locations, right? So when someone says your sensitive location information, like maybe you were at, you were at a place of worship, maybe you were at an AA meeting, an NRA meeting, Planned Parenthood, you know, any a therapist's office, any amount of places that the government doesn't have any business knowing about, right? Just because you happen to be walking around and had looked at shoes online or whatever reason that that information was collected. And so I just think that distinction needs to be made because not only has the Supreme Court already decided that people's location history is constitutionally protected, but the courts are currently considering even what happens when you're doing massive geolocation searches with, with geofences and other things. And the, the question, the constitutionality of those considerations, which I know is a different topic are being considered. And so the idea that you can go to a data broker who may be gathering data to advertise to people and buy all that information, have a query to locate people wherever they are as the government should be deeply concerning. And like I said, this is one of those places where you have this unwarranted, uh, this warrantless collection of information that can be queried in 702. You have this not fully understood amount of information is collected under executive orders. And then the purchase piece, it's really sort of a, a trifecta of the erosion, not just the Fourth Amendment, but any notions of personal privacy. And so that's why we feel very strongly that this is a moment for Congress to do sort of what, what Patrick said earlier, right, which is look at one standard that would protect people's privacy as they move about in the world, whether it's their location data, their digital communications, you know, whatever piece the government is, is taking on. Um, so that goes back to my balloon example, I suppose. I think the other thing I just wanna pull out that Liza said that's really important to remember, there is not a thing in terms of protecting people's personal private information that keeps the government from acting on intelligence of bad actors overseas about to do bad things. There really is not a single thing that says, if you, because you know, even we get to a warrant standard, and I say this to someone you know, who works at an association of criminal defense lawyers, the warrant standard is not that high a bar to meet. It's not as though you, know, you have to go through 27 steps to get a warrant. Warrants are given out fairly easily. What it is, is it is that speed hump that says you're not just going to go rifle through this database to look up things, you know, on a whim. What it says is if this is going to show up in a criminal case, there's a warrant there, you know what database has been searched, right? These are almost like minimal types of protections, and they absolutely don't in any way hinder the types of investigations that are being used to promote the need for this kind of intelligence collections. And so I just want to make sure that sits with people, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jamana. And I'm going to uh, draw two points to turn into a, one to turn into a question. The first is that uh, I think it's worth making sure every staffer in the audience knows that there have been bipartisan efforts to get these answers to investigate exactly these issues, um, and in particular around geolocation, um, bipartisan bicameral efforts. Um, there are a lot of questions that need answers, and they are going to need answers before Congress can make an informed decision about any of these issues, but especially Section 702. Um, Frankly, there is a lot of oversight that needs to get done, and uh, the committees of jurisdiction could be having those hearings tomorrow, um, and I think most of us would argue should. Um, we need these answers. But I also want to draw attention to maybe a question mark that I have um, on the other side of Patrick describing you know, geolocation sharing. Um, what if, if the FBI believes it can buy geolocation information, um, including about Americans, um, what does it say about what they think is legal to purchase uh, more generally. Uh, there are obviously a lot of other kinds of records about Americans uh, available for sale at this point that aren't location. Um, I would invite anybody to answer that. But I'm going to call on Patrick. Liza, do you want to go? I mean, I was just going to say, just, just as uh, Title I of FISA is the high watermark for FISA, uh, 
within the Fourth Amendment space to say that something gets full Fourth Amendment protections uh, and that the government has to obtain a warrant in order to acquire that information. That's the high watermark under the Fourth Amendment. And that's what the Supreme Court applied to geolocation data. So if the government believes that it can simply evade that by purchasing geolocation data, then presumably any amendment that receives Fourth Amendment protections uh, is to some extent going to be subject to that same analysis. Now, we, we can't know because the government is not sharing its analysis here. It is not sharing uh, it's it's not sharing its behavior, uh, which agencies are are purchasing which databases for which purposes. Uh, the statement at the hearing about the FBI's purchase of data was the first time that an agency has publicly acknowledged its role in purchasing data. So this is happening in a black box. But I think we need to be deeply concerned that all kinds of very sensitive data uh, that Americans generate, for example, you know, internet search uh, records and and web browsing records, that sorts of thing, um, could potentially be subject to this uh, government purchase loophole around the Fourth Amendment. Thank you, Liza. Um, I, I have a, a great question from an attendee. I hope uh, the person who just submitted it can can hold on. I think there's a, a question I wanted to ask that'll set this up uh, quite nicely. Congressman Goodlatte, um, you know, we've we've talked around, uh, and in some cases specifically about basically the, the political opportunity that the fight this year around reauthorization of Section 702 or possible reauthorization of Section 702 represents. Can you talk more about that? What, what, do, we, what, what do you mean by um, uh, leverage um, you mentioned during your opening statement? Well, uh, several years ago, it was uh, discovered as a part of the revelations that came out of the Edward Snowden uh, debacle that uh, the government was gathering huge quantities of uh, mass communications, of metadata about Americans' telecommunications. Uh, and the Congress took the opportunity that year to uh, eliminate that particular loophole. As I've said before, it didn't solve the problem, but it certainly helped to close off one area where Americans' privacy was being invaded. And not only did we close it off for telecommunications uh, uh, gathered by the NSA, but we get closed it off with regard to other types of information, like medical information, financial information, and we closed it off with regard to more than just that one agency. Uh, the way we were successful in doing that was to use the expiration of certain uh, portions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act uh, and to use the fact that the House Judiciary Committee passed a very strong bipartisan bill uh, that then got very, very strong support. And the full House representatives went over to the Senate. Uh, the Senate had a lot of different ideas about how to solve this, but couldn't agree on any one uh, and wound up uh, in a situation where they uh, largely accepted uh, the House legislation with a, with a few tweaks to it. So the fact that Section 702, which uh, many uh, have already said is a very important uh, section of FISA for uh, the intelligence gathering community uh, and the law enforcement community is expiring. Uh, this is an opportunity to use that fact to address concerns that were supposed to have been addressed in the past that law enforcement agencies and others have claimed were addressed in the past. Uh, and clearly given the reports of uh, massive amounts of uh, backdoor searches uh, of 702 gathered data uh, and other problems, this is an opportunity uh, to address that. So uh, some, some uh, of the staff members in uh, participating in this program may be thinking about other uh, reforms to uh, you know, our intelligence laws that need to be addressed. Uh, this is an opportunity. Not all of them are going to get addressed in this process. I don't, you know, I don't think it's uh, going to be a comprehensive reform of, of government surveillance, uh, but things that could uh, allow government to continue to act, even if 702 did not exist, need to be included in the discussion of how 702 can do its core function of gathering information about threats from outside the United States by non-U.S. Uh, citizens. Um, at the same time that we keep that going, we need to close and improve the problems with 702 and address problems with uh, executive orders and problems with uh, simply buying data. And I want to stress again how important it is that this issue 
uh, even, even in the difficult times that uh, have existed on Capitol Hill in recent years, uh, has remained a very strong bipartisan issue. You see that in the statements that are being made by members on both sides of the aisle. Uh, uh, you see that in legislation that passed uh, the uh, uh, House of Representatives in overwhelming bipartisan fashion, like the uh, NDO uh, Non-Disclosure Act, uh, uh, Fairness Act that passed the, the House of Representatives, didn't get through the Senate. Uh, the Press Act it got through the House, overwhelmingly bipartisan, didn't get through the Senate. The same opportunity exists here on a much larger scale. And so I encourage people uh, to use the opportunity of the moment uh, to leverage the fact that this bill is, this law is expiring at the end of the year uh, to uh, get some really good bipartisan reforms. Uh, and if we pass them out of the House, I think it, it's gonna be well received by many, many in the Senate as well. Thank you so much, Congressman. So this is a, a, a more particular question about whether or not something fits in to the debate that you just described. But I, I, I do want to pull out that I think Congressman Goodlight did a great job describing uh, a few of the corners um, that are already relevant purchase of data, the gaps in FISA, which Liza has also talked about, um, and obviously a variety of other civil liberties protections like the Press Act, the NDO Fairness Act. Um, the question specifically uh, that we got focuses on reverse search warrants. Um, and so uh, the question is, uh, sh does that fit into this conversation or should it be tackled separately? Um, and I would invite anybody to answer that. I would really like to jump in on that. Um, you know, I, I would say I would say they were cousins. <laughs> And the reason I say that is when you look at this kind of intel collection, um, it's really like a collect first, you know, query later kind of collection. And so like the normal idea that people have in terms of thinking about when the government can go rifling through your things is that something has occurred, you are somehow implicated, and then they go to, I mean, this is how it happens on TV. They go to the judge, they get a warrant, they say now, because we believe you're implicated in this thing that happened, we can search through your things. Versus we've collected all of your information and maybe a thing didn't even happen. We just decided to go sort of rifle through your things, right? It's, it's almost sort of turn the whole process on its head when you think about it. And I think it's also important for people, I'm just gonna step back a minute to understand that you, like the, the information that, of, that people, for US persons information that gets gathered in these programs comes through a couple of ways. One is incidental collection, right? Where maybe they are targeting that foreign target overseas, but a US person is communicating with them. But then there's also inadvertent uh, collection, meaning that they thought maybe this was a foreign person overseas, but it wasn't. And so both of those can be true. Um, and so there's a number of ways where people's information ends up in this database. And that's just sort of two of them. The thing about reverse searches that is very similar to that is that you have, at least in that case, you have a thing that has happened, a crime that has occurred. And I'm just doing this for the folks who may not understand what a reverse search is. What they don't have is a suspect. Right. So it's missing what you have on TV where they say this crime has occurred and we believe this person is implicated for these reasons, which is when you go to a judge and say, here's the reasons we believe this person's implicated. And here's the reasons we believe if we search, you know, this house or this device or this thing, we're going to find evidence of that crime. You go to a judge instead and say, we know a thing has happened. We have no idea who did it. We have no suspects. So therefore, we would like you to tell us either everybody whose device is connected in this location during this period of time or everybody who has searched for these terms online and then start to rifle through all they have to the first step of that is to rifle through every search that has happened or every phone that is located anywhere or any device that's located anywhere to find out who has searched for these terms or located in this area to then try to narrow that down to who you might be looking for so it turns the entire search process on its head right in the intel collection community it's scenario you're talking about collect first query later in this scenario you're talking about rifle through every bit of stored information, everybody searches, everybody's location to try and find out who we might find suspect. Should this be done in this debate? You know, my answer is if it can be done well, yes. <laughs> and if it can, it should be done separately. My concern when we start to wonder like, should we do this now? Should we do this later? Is that there are times when you go through this kind of legislative process. And I absolutely agree with Congressman Good that this has been bipartisan for a lot of reasons, including this kind of collection really does not distinguish your political party, your background, your anything. It is all collected in one place and it is all of our information, right, in one way or another. Um, so everybody has a vested interest in, in having these protections in place. 
my concern is and why this moment is so pressing is because there is a reauthorization, reauthorization debate. And you do have the administration coming and saying, we need these authorities to stay in place, which means that this will have to move or the program goes away. And that's why there's a particular interest in doing it now. But again, my, my proviso there is that it should not be done unless it can be done well. If I could add just one thing to that, um, to elaborate a little bit on Jimena's description of these reverse search warrants, a, a reverse search is essentially the equivalent of searching every house in the neighborhood of where a crime committed to figure out who your suspect is. And that starts to look very much like a general warrant, uh, which is what uh, the framers of the Fourth Amendment were trying to avoid with, with the particularity requirement of the Fourth Amendment. And I'm sorry to, to get into some of, of the technical legal jargon, but all of this is to say that this is a really good example of ways in which the courts really struggle uh, to keep the law uh, in line with technology, with new technologies. And so what we're seeing is there are some courts that are actually issuing warrants for this, even though it kind of looks like a general warrant, which courts are not supposed to issue. And you have other courts saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm not sure this is not sure this squares with the Fourth Amendment. And so the courts are kind of struggling with this issue. And as we know, it takes them years to do that. Uh, I don't think Americans should have to wait years to have their Fourth Amendment rights vindicated. So I think it, it is important for Congress to step in with a solution. Um, should it be done as part of Section 2 reauthorization? Exactly what Jumana said. If it can be done, if it can be done well, it should be done because it's very, very hard otherwise to find these opportunities for these kinds of uh, legislative changes. Thank you, Liza. And I, I, oh, please, Congressman. I'm just going to add that it's it's part and parcel with the overall problem here, which is that's exactly what uh, uh, the FBI often does with their queries. Um, they're not they're not. Um, going to look for information. They already have the information and they're asking for permission uh, to, to look at it. The court gives them a blanket authorization to search all they want. They did 3.4 million times uh, in 2020. They claim they reduced it 93% last year. Well, that still leaves over 200,000 of these searches. So it's a similar type of problem. Uh, and I think it's appropriate uh, to be addressed in these circumstances, particularly as it pertains to federal uh, reverse searches. Thank you, Congressman. Um, and I, I want to offer quickly to, I guess, in particular, the staffers in the room. Um, you know, historically, I think intelligence agencies, the administration approach uh, has served to kind of artificially limit these debates. Um, and to some extent, when you're, you know, uh, knee deep in the weeds of section 702, um, one, you can feel kind of lost and uh, two, uh, you end up only talking about section 702. But really, I think what uh, is more relevant for members of Congress to be talking about is kind of the reverse. We're, we're talking about warrantless access to uh, information about Americans, right? And that crosses a, cr a, a much more than section 702 alone. And so, um, you know, the, the question of whether or not it fits, I think, is Kind of to Liza's point and also Jumana's, um, you know, the appetite for Congress to really tackle these issues. And that's one of the reasons why uh, a number of us, um, uh, you know, have called for hearings as soon as possible. We need to have the substantive discussion. Congress needs to have the substantive deep dives that that provides. Um, and there are a number of uh, paths to go. And um, I'll just flag one more time. There will be a lot more panels this year, and it will be in part to dive to some of the substance of those things. And again, for anybody who missed it, also to keep you apprised of the political lay of the land. Um, I, uh, I, th I think and we've done- Let me, let me, let oh, yeah, please. Yeah interrupt there to add something I intended to say earlier, and that is that uh, there are civil liberties organizations across the political spectrum, uh, including, uh, you mentioned, for example, Freedom Work, but also Americans for Prosperity, the Due Process Institute. Uh, there are uh, all the organizations represented here today and many, many more, and you'll be hearing from them uh, in different combinations, but they are working very collaboratively in a bipartisan way themselves. Uh, in encouraging this bipartisan activity in the Congress, which we're seeing to, starting to develop. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, I think the conversation just now does a, a good job of um, describing kind of the open field for interested members of Congress, for privacy champions on the Hill uh, to pursue uh, 
substantive reform beyond Section 702. But uh, one of the questions that came in, I think, helpfully draws us back in a little bit. So obviously, there's more to do in terms of getting our, uh, you know, our hands from the public's perspective, but also members of Congress's arms around, um, you know, all the different warrantless surveillance that takes place, the surveillance that happens without statutory authority and without court oversight, a number of things in that territory. Um, but somebody wants to know specifically, uh, you know, what are the specific solutions, I guess, that are already part of the conversation, um, which, of course, I, I think is an important thing for us to get to. And uh, somehow it's only 13 minutes left before noon. Um, so we're going to do that now. Um, that's an open uh, pitch. And uh, Patrick, I see you just unmuted. So let's start with you. Yeah, I'll start and then others should absolutely join. Uh, you know, there, are, I, I think the question is great that, that Juliana uh, put in the chat. Um, there are three, I think, buckets that I think of when I'm ta talking about Section 702 policy reforms. The first is one you've heard a lot about today. And those are, that is, um, a fix to the back, backdoor search problem. So requiring an individualized court order before an intelligence agency, FBI, CIA, NSA, or others can conduct a search that looks for the specific communications of an American within the pool of 702 data. That is one of the most important reforms Congress could adopt. And uh, the FBI especially will, will raise all kinds of alarm bells as it's done for the past 10 years about what that would entail. But the history of the compliance violations that we've seen and efforts to adopt stronger reforms show that they can be done notwithstanding those protests. Um, like Bob said, there have been some changes that, that alter the number of backdoor searches, but they still remain in the hundreds of thousands each year. The second category of reforms um, that Congress could adopt would be to tighten the criteria for who can be targeted under Section 702. Although the targets themselves are foreigners, that would have a significant benefit for Americans by reducing the amount of incidental collection that occurs. It would reduce the number of Americans who are swept up in the course of this mass surveillance that today involves targeting more than 230,000 individuals, groups, and associations overseas. So that would help Americans protect their privacy. The third bucket of reforms um, that I think of are ones that would improve court oversight and accountability for this type of surveillance. So it would ensure that people who, whose communications are searched using these backdoor searches and then are prosecuted get notice and have enough information to bring a meaningful, fair challenge um, in court, which has not been the case to date. It would ensure that the government cannot invoke state secrets just to have these cases thrown out and therefore block court review um, in our public courts of how this surveillance uh, intrudes on Fourth Amendment rights. And it would ensure that the FISA court itself has more help from independent amici when it considers these surveillance programs behind closed doors. All of those would strengthen oversight and would ensure that Americans um, civil liberties and privacy is protected. Thank you, Patrick. And I, I'm going to take a moment to to flag here, um, you know, that a lot of these ideas, especially the ones specific to Section 702, have been in, uh, you know, uh, congressional awareness, let's say, for, for many years. And if we go back to the previous Section 702 reauthorization, which took place from 2017 into January of 2018, um, uh, there was an effort uh, to replace that reauthorization with what was called the USA Rights Act. It's a very strong bill that covered a large number of Section 702 specific issues. Um, at this point, you, you know, uh, as Patrick alluded to, the the violations that have uh, become public since that fight do an, an enormous amount. I mean, if you if you were to pull up um, Liza's testimony from 2017. Um, every issue that she describes being a concern has proven to be correct. Um, and that is, uh, you know, really changes the dynamic. But even back in 2017, before a lot of the more current news and political dynamics took shape, um, uh, 183 members of the House voted for that bill to replace the 702 authorization that was being offered. Um, there are other examples like that, um, and and we can make them available. And but if anybody wants to do a more uh, you know a deep dive into the exact text that reformers have uh, proposed 
this would be again relatively specific to section 702 um it's worth checking out the usa rights act um liza i saw you unmute so i want to go to you but we have uh, two more questions that i'm hoping we can keep time for uh then then never mind i, I had a couple of other specific um please please thoughts about... it's, it's important okay Okay, so uh, one of them is to end abouts collection. Abouts collection it refers to when the government collects communications that are not merely to or from a target, but actually about the target because it includes some information related to the target in the communication. Um, and that uh, opens up the door to the collection of uh, communications of people who are not themselves legitimately targets of surveillance, and it makes it much more likely that purely domestic communications are going to be uh, swept in. Um, there were so many problems with abouts collection that uh, the NSA was effectively forced to stop doing it in, in 2017. Uh, and it, when Congress reauthorized Section 702 at the beginning of 2018, it basically uh, said that if the NSA wanted to restart about collection, it would have to give Congress 30 days notice, essentially. Um, since then, according to the government, they have not restarted about collection. It's clearly not necessary. Uh, and it uh, ha has unique, um, raises unique concerns uh, for Americans' privacy. So Congress should just prohibit it uh, and just have it done with. <laughs> um, and then the other one that I was going to mention is to... Um, really strengthen the limitations on retention of Americans' communications. As part of minimization, the agencies are supposed to minimize the retention of Americans' communications. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the agency's rules allow them to hold on to that information for what ends up being a functional minimum of five years, because there are so many uh, exceptions to that five-year rule. Five years is too long, and there are too many exceptions. So Congress should specify that by minimizing retention, it is talking about maybe a two to three year period without all of these uh, sort of exceptions that are uh, no doubt swallowing the rule. Thank you, Liza. Um, Can and I so, add one thing, Sean? I know there's other questions. Yes, no, no. And actually, let me let me add to that. I was actually going to turn to you because uh, obviously attorney-client pr uh, uh, protected communications are super important to the criminal defense lawyers. Um, could you talk about that? And I can imagine, uh, you know, Liza started to hint at uh, some of the weedsier stuff, things like minimization procedures. Um, we are running out of time, but I, I, I think it would be great for you to comment on uh, whatever you were about to say and what Liza just said. Um, well, it was coming right off of what Liza just said, because when it comes to minimization, I think what needs to be clear for people is when you're gathering all these communications, you are absolutely going to end up gathering privileged communications, which is communications between attorneys, their teams, and their clients. Um, the, the communications privilege is older than the Constitution. It's a fundamental understanding of in order to have any kind of fair adversarial system, people have to feel free to speak to their attorneys, right? And and, and in the worries that somehow this is going to let criminal activity occur, there's absolutely a crime fraud exception that has never gone away. Every attorney knows that if you somehow get involved in, you know, rather than your client saying, here's the 27 things I've done in the past, and this is what I'm facing, your client says, well, here's the thing I'm going to do. And you say, this is how you do it. That obviously doesn't apply. And so I just want to lay that to rest before anyone says, well, what if the information is in there? Um, but uh, other than that, every kind of communication between an attorney, their team, and I say their team because it's not just the attorney themselves, it can be the investigator, it can be the paralegal, it can be anybody associated with that representation, and the person in question is supposed to enjoy absolute privilege. It is not supposed to be accessed unless it falls into that narrow exception. In reality, and the, and the FISA courts have looked at the question of privilege, we have a couple of problems. One is, from our perspective, the way the FISA court has looked at the question of privileged communications that were captured uh, is really a Fourth Amendment analysis, right, of whether or not you can use something in a criminal proceeding. That is not the appropriate analysis for privilege. Privileged communication is privileged because it's privileged, not because it's going to be used in a criminal case. And so fundamentally, it is not meant to be accessed. With the way the FISA court has analyzed it, there are some procedures to segregate it in the context of a criminal prosecution, which I'll get to in a second, but then they leave open that it is actually fair game for any kind of you know, analytics on foreign intelligence. That is already a fundamental problem. The second problem that we see is that there is a different standard in every single agency on how you address privileged information. What that means is the NSA has their protocol, the FBI has their protocol, the CIA has their protocol. The point is, for attorneys, 
there should not be a guessing game of, well, who has handled this and what provisions apply? Some of them talk about just the attorneys. Some of them talk about the attorneys and their teams. This is completely unworkable when it comes to the question of privilege, right? Because you can't have to guess at what agency is handling it to understand what protections apply. And the last thing I'll say is, uh, you know, which which hopefully is not a surprise when you talk about the Intel community, there's no transparency in the sense that even from the pieces of how privileged communication is handled that we've seen, parts of it are redacted. And so there is not a consistent, clear, transparent policy on how privileged communications are handled. And that should be a concern to anybody who's ever had to consult an attorney, right? I mean, this is where I go back to the fact that this is not in any way a partisan issue because none of this collection distinguishes anybody's political thoughts, ideologies, religion, personal tastes, it's all getting collected. And so we really, really encourage um, Congress to look at sort of from the macro to the micro, how to ensure that people's privacy and privileged communications are protected. Thank you, Jumana. Um, and now I'm going to ask the last question uh, that we have uh, had come in from a staffer. I'm going to presage that I'm going to try to hold as many of the panelists as have time to stand for another couple minutes because the, the second big piece of news from last week, uh, of course, was a, a pretty stunning disclosure from Representative LaHood, and I'd like to get the panelists' take on that, and maybe that can be our, uh, basically our wrap-up question. But in case uh, the staffer has to leave at noon, understandably enough, I want to get to their question first. Um, is there any personal information that should be available to the government without a warrant, or is the goal of reforming Section 702 to require a warrant for access to all and any personal information of Americans? Can you, can you repeat the first part of that question? I, I just had a little yeah. glitch in my um, service, sorry. No. Is there any personal information that should be available to the government without a warrant, or is the goal of reforming 702 to require a warrant for access to all information? So, so this is another part of what Congress should be looking at, I think, as part of the reauthorization of Section 702, because for the longest time, for decades, uh, the Supreme Court held that if you store information with a third party, you lose any reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. And so a whole uh, host of different types of data were just automatically considered not protected by the Fourth Amendment, and therefore you didn't have to get a warrant uh, to access those types of data because of this third party doctrine. Uh, in 2018, uh, the Supreme Court uh, ma made a dent in this third party doctrine and said that cell phone location information stored by cell phone companies um, was protected by the Fourth Amendment, even though people voluntarily disclose that information to the phone company. And therefore, the government needs a warrant to obtain the information. And that decision turned on essentially just how incredibly sensitive this information is. Given the principle that the Supreme Court articulated in that case, Congress needs to start looking at these other types of data and analyze whether those types of data reach that level of sensitivity where there should be a warrant requirement in place. And, and I say that because the courts will eventually get to this, right? The Supreme Court looked at cell phone location information, that's it. Eventually the Supreme Court will look at communications metadata, it will look at internet search and web browsing records, it will look at biometric data, that's gonna be years. And our Fourth Amendment rights should not hang in the balance. So Congress, as part of this reauthorization, should be asking itself what type of personal data is sensitive at a level where it should be protected by the Fourth Amendment. And I would say that should include communications metadata. It should include certainly all types of geolocation information, <clears throat> web browsing and internet search records, absolutely, biometric data. So that <clears throat> those to me, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a frog in my throat, but those should be uh, definitely part of the analysis uh, that Congress performs. Yeah, and to, and to add to that, that suggests that there can be things in that uh, where there might be an exception. There historically have been exceptions to the warrant requirement for hot pursuit uh, uh, to prevent some imminent act uh, from occurring. Uh, but those are narrow exceptions, and uh, they've been broadened out quite a lot with the evolution of the availability of huge quantity of data in the in the digital age. Thank you. And I would just point out that, uh, you know, I think Liza did a great job describing, um, you know, the, the information that rises to the level of a reasonable expectation of privacy, to use a, a Fourth Amendment term. Um, but it is 
pretty much, uh, it, it strikes me as impossible to describe the amount of information about Americans that are held by private actors or otherwise uh, available to the government. And, um, you know, I think there is obvious sensitivity uh, of a different sort to things like location information, as the Supreme Court has recognized, as Liza pointed out, but also to these other questions that uh, have also just been specifically identified, like biometrics and things of that nature. The point is, is Congress gets to decide this. These are really, really enormous policy questions. These are constitutional questions. Um, and uh, as we heard at the beginning of the panel, the courts are not reaching them. Um, so this is just a question of how much Congress uh, is going to fall behind and how many opportunities it has to act. And uh, I think what you've heard from the panel today is that uh, this is the year to act. This is the biggest opportunity um, pretty much any member of Congress is going to have to make this impact uh, to step up and protect their constituents' privacy. Um, before I let everybody go, one, thank you everybody uh, for staying on so long. Um, but I do want to touch on the disclosure from Representative LaHood last week. Um, I don't have anybody primed for this, but but uh, I know we all covered it. Um, can somebody just tell us what happened and then can somebody tell us the significance? And, um, uh, and then I'd like to close probably with another note from Congressman Goodlad about what it may mean for the political uh, fight and opportunity ahead. Um, so who wants to start by talking about what, what the disclosure was? I'm happy, to, <clears throat> I'm happy to jump in assuming my voice works. But as part of a report on compliance in incidents that the government submitted a couple of years ago uh, that was only made public fairly, fairly recently, a few months ago, uh, the government disclosed that among uh, a large number of improper backdoor searches that the FBI conducted in violation of its own internal rules, there was a search uh, uh, using the name of a sitting U.S. congressman. Um, and what happened quite recently is that Representative Darren LaHood uh, who has actually been appointed as the head of a working group within the House Intelligence Committee that's looking at Section 702 reform, disclosed that he had looked at classified documents that indicated to him that he was, in fact, the subject of this unlawful backdoor search. Now, what's the significance of that? I would say the significance is that that's got to be the tip of the iceberg. And I say that uh, because <clears throat> these same reports uh, disclosed that there had been improper backdoor searches for multiple U.S. government officials, journalists, and political commentators, but also because the FISA court has pointed out that the audits, the internal audits that are done that discover these compliance incidents, which are then reported, um, touch on only a small fraction of the Section 702 activity that's conducted within the FBI, because each field office might be visited only once every few years. Uh, and so the court itself um, acknowledged that the violations were actually probably far more widespread than the compliance reports would indicate. Um, and so you have to imagine that Representative LaHood uh, very well might not have been the only US Congress member uh, who was subject to a backdoor search improperly. It, it could be one of your bosses. And I think that's, for me, that's a, a major takeaway from this. Thank you, Liza. And I, I'll note that Representative LaHood described this as, uh, you know, a perceptible separation of powers issue as well. Um, and uh, this risks weed, so I'm just going to touch on it. But um, for anybody who's interested in digging in more after this conversation, you know, if you dig into that compliance uh, violation, it, you know, clearly uh, was an unacceptable, uh, egregious uh, search using uh, the congressman's name. Um, but the, the compliance violation itself was that it was overly broad. It wasn't that the government was searching through information using a member of Congress's name. And so Liza's talking about, you know, there are other violations, but really uh, we don't have a sense of how often this kind of a search happens that is considered compliant, but is otherwise a search for a member of Congress's communications without a warrant. Um, sure. Please, uh, Congressman. Just jump in and say, I, I suspect that there are a number of other members of Congress who think they're that one name. And I suspect also that there are many more members of Congress who have no idea uh, that they have been surveilled in some fashion or another, not just under this uh, backdoor search under 702, but under other authorities. Uh, and so I think it's important uh, that not only do we address that problem uh, in 702, but we address this broader problem of the government gathering data from a whole host of different sources and having it available uh, to search like that. Uh, it's inappropriate. Uh, it is a threat to our separation of powers under the Constitution. Uh, and it's a threat to uh, assuring that we have uh, an independent branch of our government that can actually step up and freely address these 
problems in a comprehensive way that uh, would satisfy, satisfy their own concerns, but more importantly, that sat, satisfy the concerns of all Americans, all of their constituents. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, and to draw a couple of the peaks out uh, of what you just said, you know, like that search is very important. As you heard earlier in the panel, uh, Jumana said, you know, a warrant requirement isn't that high, right? You're not getting a conviction when you secure a warrant. Um, the question really is, is anybody independent of the FBI or who, whatever agency is doing the backdoor search reviewing that? Or is it all an internal executive branch decision? Um, and I think, uh, I think the coalition of, of folks in front of you and that you'll be hearing from throughout the year um, you know, emphatically say, we need that independent check. Um, we wouldn't see so many compliance violations if we had it. Um, so we are out of time for questions. I really appreciate uh, the, the overwhelming number of you who were able to stay for not only an hour and a half, but now uh, six minutes over. Um, I want to just invite folks to offer the one thing, uh, if they have it ready, uh, that they want uh, the audience to take away from this discussion. Um, and then we'll close down after that. So I'd like to start with uh, Patrick and then Jumana and then Liza and then Congressman Goodlight, if you could uh, give us a final comment uh, to wrap things up, um, that'd be great. And I'm also gonna take this opportunity to thank Representative Lofgren, who uh, obviously provided the opening statement for today's discussion uh, and has just generally been uh, obviously a privacy advocate for, for decades. Um, Patrick. I'll just finish by saying there's gonna be a lot of talking points that everyone hears about um, this surveillance over the coming year. And I encourage people to reach out to our organizations uh, here today uh, to, to really understand um, you know, where the weaknesses are, or how those talking points may be misleading. Because as Liza said, there's just um, so much to this that is not captured by the administration's talking points. And um, we want to be here as resources to help unpack that. Thank you. Jumana? I just want to go back and underscore the point that Patrick made earlier, which is that as Congress moves forward in considering this, to really think about considering how to curtail the behavior rather than how to address a program. Because as long as we keep trying to go program by program, then it's always going to end up happening somewhere else. And so this is really the opportunity to address these things in a holistic way. And you know, going back even to the Supreme Court conversation that you were having, um, no one has to wait for the Supreme Court to get one of these cases and decide, right? Congress has the authority to address these issues right now. And so my hope would be that this gets addressed not just in the context of 702, but in the context of the way in which the government is dealing with people's personal, private data and communications. Thank you. Uh, Liza? I would emphasize that not only should this be done, but it can be done. Um, I, I know all of the different reforms we're talking about, all these different programs, it may sound overwhelming when you boil it down to these simple principles uh, that Congressman Goodlatte laid out. Uh, there are definitely ways to do this, and uh, there are people who can, who can uh, craft the language that's needed. That part uh, absolutely can be done, but perhaps even more importantly, uh, the scale of this type of reform um, seems daunting in, in a Congress where Frankly, the political environment sometimes makes it hard to do even some small things. This is different. Uh, this is kind of a unicorn where there is just tremendous bipartisan report, uh, sorry, bi bipartisan support uh, for, for doing real reform for Section 702. And I would say seize that opportunity. This really can be done. Thank you, Liza. I'll sneak my uh, quick comment here. Um, as, as has been said, I just want to draw this out and emphasize it. Uh, this coalition and literally dozens of other groups uh, are eager to support members who are trying to engage in this. So please do not hesitate to reach out, like Patrick said. Um, Congressman Goodlatte, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And I simply want to thank everybody, uh, Demand Progress and the Wikimedia Foundation in particular for hosting this, uh, members of uh, congressional staffs and many, many other people will have an opportunity to have uh, uh, further sessions like these. Uh, and, and we welcome hearing from all of you as well when you have your questions and so on. And you know, you'll be hearing from, from us and from your constituents regarding this. When you do, and when you start seeing legislation, some of it you may see sooner, some of it you may see uh, as the year evolves, take those four principles that I outlined at the outset 
and apply them to the legislation you're looking at. Does it address all the problems uh, that uh, we've outlined during this hour and a half? But more importantly, does it protect the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution? Does it establish uh, a law that respects those principles? And uh, Sean, I know you'll make sure that uh, everyone participating has an opportunity to have that. And, and finally, take advantage of this bipartisan opportunity at a time when bipartisanship may be hard to find in other areas of legislating. This is not one of those areas. This is an opportunity to really get something done uh, for your member of Congress's constituents. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congressman Goodlatte. Um, yes, I will certainly be following up with uh, all of the RSVPs um, probably around the end of the week uh, with materials, including everything you've seen today. Um, do not hesitate to reach out. And uh, on a closing note, I too would like to thank everybody for joining, all of you in the audience, Representative Lofgren for the opening statement, Congressman Goodlad, it's always a pleasure to have your uh, participation, um, and the ACLU and Wikimedia for helping put this on. Uh, so thank you all again, and I hope you have a great week.